Welcome to all of you to this panel entitled Governance and Legal Frameworks to Promote Sustainable Landscapes. It's a great pleasure and honor to moderate this session and we have some renowned panelists who will share some of their experiences from across the ASEAN region in terms of the many governance challenges we face. We hope the panel will examine the complex governance of land and natural resources in the region and explore ways in which we can shape institutions, decision-making processes and rules so that they can foster and encourage sustainability in terms of landscape governance. The landscapes in this region, as in many other parts of the developing world, are in constant change, shaped by various forces that interact in very complex ways. The production and livelihood activities of smallholders, large-scale land-based investments, and the multi-level governance systems that operate at global, regional, national, and sub-national levels. These governance systems all interact and ultimately influence who has access to and rights of use to land and forest resources and how these are ultimately managed. In the Southeast Asian context of rapid change and this complexity, new opportunities but also risks are emerging for the future of how these landscapes are managed. So we hope we will present a number of very different cases related to transnational regulation and particularly the role of certification processes, the emerging progress that's been made in relation to the, in Indonesia, what's called the SVLK process, the FLEC-T VPA process, some of the challenges associated with law enforcement, with particular reference to Indonesia, many of the challenges related to ensuring that the rights of indigenous peoples and other rural disenfranchised communities are upheld, and many other challenges associated with how we can ultimately try and push the agenda in terms of devolving authority for the management of resources to local communities. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure first and foremost to introduce His Excellency Tisi Kun, who is Secretary of State in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries in Cambodia. Tisi Kun was formerly the head of the Forestry Administration in Cambodia and where during his tenure uh, he was also the chair of the mandated technical working group on forestry and environments, um, which is co-chaired with representatives of the donor community. He completed his doctoral research with particular reference to community forestry at the University of Sciences in Malaysia in 2012 and was recently appointed as Secretary of State in the Ministry of Agriculture. Secondly, it's my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Ambassador Olaf Schuh, who came to Indonesia as the Ambassador for Indonesia, Brunei Dar es Salaam and ASEAN in 2012, is that right? Um, he is a Swedish diplomat with extensive experience of both multilateral negotiations focusing on peace and security as well as broader bilateral development agendas. And I think he's thrown himself very much into the fray with regard to the European Union's interest in supporting the FLECTI DPA process. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thirdly, it's a great pleasure, and for many of you from Indonesia, I'm sure he doesn't really need an interruption. Mas uh, Ahmed Santosa is a, an extremely experienced environmental lawyer with more than 25 years of experience. He was instrumental in helping frame and shape the environmental framework law in Indonesia. And since when, he has been more recently appointed as deputy head of the President's Delivery Unit for Development Monitoring Oversight, Mukapa Empa, for those who know that I speak fluent Indonesian. Fourthly, it's my pleasure to introduce Ruka Sombolini, who is the deputy to the Secretary General of Amman. And for those of you who know Indonesia, this is one of the most important alliances, Masyarakat Adat Nusarantara, I apologize for the pronunciation, which is an alliance of indigenous peoples, uh, organizations and representatives across the whole of the Indonesian archipelago. And she's the international advocacy coordinator of Amman. So it's a pleasure to have you with us on this panel. Last but not least, it's a pleasure to also introduce the executive director of the Forest Stewardship Council. 
Kim Carstensen has had also a long and illustrious history, formerly working with World Wildlife Fund as head of the Danish WWF delegation and subsequently WWF International before he joined as the overall leader of FSC's work globally in October 2012. So will you welcome all the panelists, please? I'm going to start by inviting His Excellency Tisikun. Um, during the panel preparations, we discussed that we thought it might be a good idea to try and start from the community level as much as possible. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tisikun, who will also speak from the podium, on the experiences from Cambodia in terms of devolving authority in relation to particularly community forestry, but also community fisheries. Tisikun. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Andrew, for your night introduction. I please allow me to stand and read uh, my uh, comment or not because the time is very limited. Actually, I have uh, many things to share with this forum. We have over 200 words that I try to condense and less than 1,000 uh, words. So, uh, the Global Landscape Forum held last year in Warsaw called for more integrated and people-centered approach and much more work on the ground. Much more work on the ground. This is what a policy maker such as myself need the most. But what to do and how to do it? Let me share then the Cambodian experience with you. The royal government of Cambodia, under the effective leadership of Prime Minister Sondag Dejo Hun Sen, has supported and actively participated such integrated and people-centered approach over the past decade. The government has recognized that it is not enough to merely tell people not to misuse natural resources. It will only be accomplished by the providing the proper incentive to operate in trend pattern of thinking, acting, and behaving. Second incentives include the securing land tenure and resource access right. Cambodia effort to ensure resource access right of the local people. We are specifically in 2002 when it imposed a logging ban from forest concession and terminated over 59% of the 1998 total forest concession area in response to their unsatisfactory performance. This includes then the lack of the engagement with the local community in the development of sustainable forest concession management plan. In the same year, Cambodia promulgated its new forestry law that provided an enabling policy and legal framework for the community forestry development in the country. We have subsequently witnessed continued the growth of the number of community forestry sites, which by 2013 has grown to 457 spread across 21 provinces and encompass more than 400,000 hectares. Community forestry has demonstrated some promising results in terms of its contribution to improving sustainable forest management practice in the country and livelihood of the forest-dependent community. While deforestation remains a critical concern in some part of the country, we the interpretation of Geospatial satellite information has indicated that forest cover managed under community forest has remained relatively impact compared to the forest cover in the adjoining area as well as in the protected area. Importantly, it has also resulted in a significantly lower rate of poverty incident among community forestry members that in that 
I experience a moment non-committee forestry member. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, over the past 10 years, community-based participatory approach has become an integral part of the natural resource management in Cambodia, associated not only with forests, but also the sustainable management of another natural resources. This has resulted, for instance, in the cancellation of fishing lot from private concessionaire and they are designated as the conservation area and a subsequent allocation to local community and the community fishery management. Indeed, there are currently 516 community fishery representing more than 89% of the total fishing area in the country. Concurrently, a comprehensive land reform program has been implemented to provide legal land title to local people, a prerequisite for the development of the rural economy. This has been supplemented since 2012 by new action on existing land policy to allocate and issue land title to over 400,000 families of landless group and more than 710,000 certificates encompassing 1.2 million hectares of land have since been issued. More importantly, Cambodia has also recently developed a white paper on land that introduced a comprehensive policy on the sustainable management of land and other resources. The white paper is directed to improve institutional coordination and integrated action of relevant stakeholders to effectively implement the government policy, regulation, strategy, and program in an equitable and sustainable manner. This aim to integrate various sector policies such as agriculture, water, forest, fishery, protected area, tourist, infrastructure development, and mining exploitation. On the basis of our experience, as well as the lesson learned from other countries, we are convinced that it takes much more than a sector-wide approach to address the interrelated forestry issue of the livelihood enhancement, poverty reduction, food security, and climate change adaptation and mitigation in the context of sustainable development. Recognizing their cross-cutting nature, this issue requires integrated action not only from <coughs> individual ministry at the national level, but also concerted action from other relevant ministry and organization at various level, from the global and regional to the national and sub-national. Lastly, but not least, Cambodia has also developed and implemented sub-national democratic development process aimed at providing equal opportunity for every citizen to participate in local development and demand better and more comprehensive public service in order to reduce inequality associated with the first economic growth. We have enacted an organic law on capital, province, municipality, district, and commune administration and established democratically elected subnational council as well as what are referred to as one veto service office. This DND approach promotes sustainable local development and contributes directly to poverty reduction through the establishment of a subnational system that embodies the primary tenets of good governance. Those tenets include accountability, adherence to the rule of law transparency, participation, equity, inclusiveness, responsiveness, efficiency, and effectiveness. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we have learned much in Cambodia from the implementation of global policies through the community-based and democratic development process over the past several years. 
Nevertheless, we as other country continue to struggle with the challenges associated with the persistence of poverty and natural resource degradation. We recognize that a primary reason for this struggle is local capacity limitation. Our underlying challenge is therefore to balance sound policy formulation at national level with either effective implementation at the sub-national level. We must indeed continue to direct our effort to, to capacity development through investment in the human resources. We have learned that we could not simply enrich a people life by securing their tenure or ownership over resource. We must also act to inspire them through self-help initiative, the provision of support of shaping their innovative capacity development and introduction of practical incentives such as those involving the sharing of benefits through carbon market and other payment for the ecosystem service. It is my hope that by sharing what we have learned together in this summit, we will be reinvigorated in our effort to develop action that will support sustainable landscape and our local people. We have learned as much from the success story than the mistake. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sisi Kun. I think your presentation uh, illustrated very well the challenges in terms of uh, getting both horizontal and vertical integration in terms of the highlights you raised, specifically linkages to D&D reforms. And I think you provided an interesting perception in terms of some of the legal reforms that had helped precipitate changes in terms of change of approach since the introduction of the logging ban in 2002. I'm next going to invite Ambassador School to talk at a very different scale in terms of the implementation of the European Union's uh, Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Voluntary Partnership Agreement. Yeah. Um, but where there are linkages in terms of TC Kunz, I understand that the discussions are now just starting with the government of Cambodia vis-a-vis -vis the FLECTI process. Indonesia, however, now has, I think, an 11-year history of uh, a multi-stakeholder process. So, Ambassador School, let's hear more about the status of... Thanks, thank you very much, uh, uh, Andrew, for uh, that very kind introduction, and thank you to C4 for a, uh, a fantastically <coughs> important uh, conference, a summit, um, and, uh, and the work you do in this area. I think my claim to fame in comparison to these experts on the panel is the fact that my surname, Skoog, actually means forest in uh, Swedish. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, v the VPA and the FLECT and how government-to-government -government contacts have, I think, contributed to a lot of progress on the Indonesian side in terms of uh, legally exports and, and timber. Ten years ago, the EU and Indonesia had a huge problem. We, the European Union, were importing too much illegal timber, and certainly Indonesia was producing and exporting uh, way too much illegal timber. There have been considerable efforts on both sides over the last decade, 11 years as, as was said, uh, to address the problem from both sides and I thought I'd say a little bit about the experience of, of that work and where we are today and the challenges that still remain. On the EU side, what we did, we developed the FLECT Action Plan, uh, an important part of which is that the EU, the EU timber regulation, which places a legal burden on importers of timber into the European Union uh, to address, uh, uh, to demonstrate that they are importing only legal timber into the European market. Uh, on the Indonesian side, uh, there has been a lot of work to develop a national timber legality assurance system, we, uh, as referred to as this SVLK, designed to certify the legality of timber at all stages of the supply chain. Over the last few years, experts on both sides have worked very hard to bring the EU's and Indonesia's efforts together in a voluntary partnership agreement, VPA. Difficult, complicated and very technical negotiations have been going on, but inspired on both sides by the same vision and goals, namely to combat illegal logging in Indonesia, 
and to promote the export of legal timber from Indonesia to the lucrative, I believe, EU market. In legal terms, the aim is to ensure recognition of the Indonesian legally certified timber as flagged licensed, licensed uh, timber, meaning that importers in the EU uh, do not have to conduct due diligence on every shipment uh, uh, from Indonesia. In other words, if Indonesia said, says that it is legal, it is legal in the European Union. This is the goal. We're not there completely yet, but we have together made tremendous progress. Negotiations between the EU and Indonesia were successfully completed. The VPA was signed in September last year and it was ratified uh, by both sides earlier this year. Legally, we are now ready to evaluate the SVLK and see if it meets the high standards set in the, our own, uh, in the VPA and expected under the EU timber regulation. An initial joint assessment of the SVLK has already been held last year. This found that Indonesia has made huge progress um, on, uh, on many uh, issues in designing and implementing the SVLK, but it also found that there are still a number of issues which need to be resolved before the system can be assessed as ready for recognition um, by the European Union. These issues have been put into a jointly agreed action plan, which is now being worked on intensively, particularly on the Indonesian side. The main remaining issues include ensuring consistency, consistency between the VPA and the SVLK, uh, both of which have evolved and changed in the years since we started all this, ensuring complete legal certification at every stage of the supply chain, and you can imagine that the challenge of this in a country as vast and diverse as Indonesia, um, and that non-certified timber cannot enter the supply chain, building up the capacity of the different actors in the SVLK system to perform their roles, including local governments, auditors, verification bodies, independent monitors, and ensuring that SVLK coverage for all parts of the industry, notably the large number of small and medium enterprises, and indeed micro-enterprises, which are a large part of the Indonesian industry here. But, of course, for each one of those implementation of fairly rigid regulations is more burdensome, more difficult. Once again, congratulations to the Indonesian authorities who have approached these tasks with energy and determination. A further national consultation is underway to revise and update the SVLK, and government actions are being prepared to ensure the universal application of the system on the entire timber industry in this country. So we will then do a further joint assessment, it's expected later this year, and we expect that it will show considerable progress towards our shared goal of winning recognition for Indonesian legally certified timber to the EU market. We're not there yet, uh, but we should acknowledge the tremendous efforts by the Indonesian authorities on, on this. I also think we can already now, and I think it's useful for this debate, draw one or two, one or two uh, 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 conclusions from our experience so far, which I think needs to be addressed for whatever process you set in, in, in motion for whatever country you're looking at. First and foremost, um, this has not been an affair just between governments. Um, at the heart of the FLEC action plan that we're looking at on the EU side, and integral to the SVLK development on the Indonesian side, has been the multi-stakeholder process. I, I really stress that so if, if there's one thing you need to remember from this intervention, it's the necessity to set up a credible multi-stakeholder process. Um, we've, we've gone through great lengths to build a common approach to the industry uh, and with civil society. You cannot hope to implement uh, what is basically an industrial measure um, like the one we're working out uh, without extensive consultation with the industry itself. And the role of civil society has been crucial. In Europe, civil society has helped shape public opinion, um, creating the demand for legal products, um, and civil society support will remain crucial also on the Indonesian side because flecked licensing will not be worth much if the environmental NGOs do not buy into it or believe in it. Alongside the legal certainty provided by flecked status, we also need to ensure that there is a market confidence it certainly helps that civil society has played a vital role on the Indonesian side too, 
has been involved in the design of this monitoring system from the start and they remain and need to be uh, remained involved as work progresses. Second conclusion, um, um, we cannot have a VPA concept that fights against uh, the market. Um, it is a concerted attempt to match the demand on the European side for legal timber with a regular supply of legal timber from Indonesia. It pleases <coughs> EU consumers to know that they help meet the concerns about illegal logging, about deforestation, etc. in Indonesia. It pleases the industry in Indonesia because it offers a real market advantage over countries which have not put in place the kind of system. Um, um, uh, and so I think if we're able to do this in Indonesia, it will give Indonesia a lot of credit, uh, not just for, for timber, but also for other products which are being looked at. Um, so um, uh, uh, our task for the coming months is to ensure that the VPA achieves all of these things in practice, but already it is clear that Indonesia is moving in the right direction. There are excellent intentions and ever-improving implementation on the ground. And as a result, Indonesia's reputation, credibility for legal timber is, I think, increasing globally. Third, and this is my last point, um, don't think this is an easy process. We've been at it for several years, 10 years already, uh, of hard effort on both sides um, uh, to get us where we are today. I think it's worth it. I hope the next few months will uh, show that this work will pay off um, for Indonesia to ship a flag license timber into the EU. Um, I think it um, would be uh, historical in the sense that Indonesia could be the first country in the world to, to do this, to achieve this with the European Union. And I think, uh, above all, it's a very good thing, uh, a realistic approach to a sustainable uh, uh, use of the natural resources of Indonesia. So thank you very much for listening to that, uh, that short intervention. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Olaf. And I think, as, uh, as he said, uh, not an easy process, a long process. And I think there are many lessons that can be learned from the flexi process in Indonesia that would be perhaps of relevance even to some of the ongoing discussions vis-a-vis -vis climate change. There are no shortcuts to resolving some of these complex governance issues. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to invite Mas Ahmed Santosa, who is going to tell us a little bit more in depth about the specific national level challenges associated with law enforcement and many of the additional efforts which have been undertaken by the government of Indonesia. That's Thank it. you very much, Andrew. Uh, dear friends, uh, distinguished speakers and dis distinguished participants, my presentation will be very much associated with my duty assignment mm -hmm. as Deputy Head of uh, UKP4 PDU, President Delivery Unit in charge for the empowerment of enforcement institutions of the President Delivery Unit. And at the same time, um, I have been assigned to coordinate legal reforms and enforcement related programs for uh, new established Red Plus agencies. At this point, it should be acknowledged that the government of Indonesia has made some progress in addressing the governance challenges. At present, there are at least five legal initiatives under the UKP4 or PDU, President Delivery Unit, and Red Plus Agency, in cooperation, of course, with the uh, ministries and agencies to promote profound governance reforms, such as developing a roadmap for legal reform on forest and peatland governance in cooperation with the Ministry of Law and Human Rights. Forest and peatland governance reform should be supported by responsive and comprehensive legal frameworks. The basic principles of justice, democracy, and sustainability are used as benchmarks for developing legislation and regulations. Second, conducting license audit and developing a license information or database system to improve license governance in the provinces of Central Kalimantan, East Kalimantan, and Jambi as a pilot provinces. The license audit covers various aspects, such as uh, corporate management aspects, 
administrative and regulatory aspects, environment, tenurial, and state revenue. Third, helping the process to recognize and protect masyarakat hukum adat, custom-based society. As some of you have already known, our central parliament has initiated bill on the protection and recognition of custom-based society, which will be elaborated by RUKA for sure. The President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono has appointed Minister of Forestry as a leading minister to respond on the parliamentary bill. The Coordinating Minister for People's Welfare is conducting policy review to follow up the Constitutional Court decision number 35, 2012, which guarantees the existence of hutan adat or customary forest with the support from the UKP4 and new established Red Plus Agency. Four, developing a robust conflict resolution mechanisms for Red Plus related conflicts. We develop conflict resolution mapping in five national parks, Kayan Mentara, Trinci Seblat, Kutai, Tesonilo, Sebangau and Sebangau National Park. The fifth, support law enforcement efforts to protect forests and peatlands by introducing what we call multi-door approach or multi the use of multi-regime approach. Why we need to introduce multi-door approach? Forestry and natural resources crimes are multi-sectoral crimes and further involving certain other crimes such as money laundering, gratification, bribery, and tax evasion. The prevailing laws and regulations tend to promote a sectoral approach such as only applying forestry law in forest areas, for example. While to improve effectiveness of law enforcement, other law should also be applied. This existing approach has limitation in handling forestry and other natural resources crimes. Therefore, to encourage more effective law enforcement, UKP4 and Red Plus Agency initiated the multi-door or multi-legal regime approach in combating natural resources related crimes. Multi-door guidelines have been implemented in cases located in Sandra Kalimantan, Aceh, and Rio province. Many cases are related to land and forest fires. In addition to criminal enforcement, Indonesia needs to utilize other legal avenues such as civil liability lawsuit and administrative enforcement to promote high level of compliance. One of the unprecedented cases was civil liability court decision which was awarded in 2013 a few months ago by the District Court of Miolago, Aceh. The court declared that plantation company was guilty of burning and clearing forests and pitland in violation of Law 32-2009 on environmental protection and management. The court granted Ministry of Environment claims against the company to pay compensation of 10 million US dollar to the state and environmental restoration fee 23 million US dollar. Meanwhile, the criminal lawsuit has currently reached the trial process. Ladies and gentlemen, as President SBY Susilo Babang Yudono stated in his keynote address yesterday, this legal measure sends a firm messages burning land and forests, logging illegally, and farming on illegal plantation, either by individual or companies, will not be tolerated nor left unpunished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mas Santos. I think you've given us uh, a, a wonderful highlight of uh, the current initiatives that have been led by Mukapampa and many of the challenges which will continue to uh, be addressed, I think, for many years to come. Now we're moving back to the community level, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ruka. Ruka 
expressed a particular interest to be able to present in Bahasa Indonesia, but I quickly wanted to do a quick show of hands. How many of you have got headsets for translation? Ruka, would you mind? Because I know your English is actually very good. <laughs> would you mind presenting in English? Because I think we do actually have a problem of a chronic shortage, given that there are about 200 people in this room. And I think I can probably count 30 headsets at best. Yes, perfect. Yeah. So um, Ruka will talk to us more about some of these land right issues. Um, actually, I thought this is very, very rare privilege where normally I am forced to speak English before international audiences. So I was thinking that I was going to take that opportunity to enjoy my privilege speaking in my own language uh, before the international uh, audience. But anyway, we have some technical problems here. So I will try and I will start uh, my presentations. Um, as you have heard, uh, the uh, previous uh, presenters have talked about a legality and law enforcement. Uh, I'm going to start my presentations of uh, giving you one examples of a uh, unintended result of uh, what so-called law uh, enforcement and legality. Uh, four of our indigenous leaders in uh, Semende Banding Agung uh, community just last week they were sentenced four years in prisons and fined for 1.5 billion uh, rupiah or around 150 uh, thousand US dollars for violating uh, they were charged violating of the law uh, on the eradication and prevention of uh, forest uh, the destructions. The law was meant to combat illegal logging, but the first victim was indigenous peoples. They live in their ancestral territories for centuries that were later claimed by the Ministry of Forestry as National Park. During the court trial, the Ministry of Forestry were unable to provide any legal documents that clearly define their territories at National Park. So that's the, the history, uh, the story that I'm going to, to, to open my speech uh, this time. Uh, but going back to an uh, event last year where we have the historical uh, constitutional court ruling that affirm the constitutional rights of indigenous peoples over our territory, including our forests, our customary forests. So we have that uh, good legal, uh, uh, good legal certainty of indigenous peoples of our over our land. And the other initiative that we have, that we over the years we continue to map the indigenous land. And the uh, National Geospatial Information Agency have accepted our map 2.4 million uh, hectares. But th those map hasn't been, hasn't been uh, officially accepted as the part of the one map policy of the government. And the second one, we also have the national strategy on the Red Plus, uh, where actually uh, also include the protections on the rights of indigenous peoples, including in the free prior and informed consent in the Red uh, Plus projects. Uh, at the moment, uh, what uh, we, we have also in the government institution is the, the Ministry of, uh, as uh, Paota mentioned earlier, the Ministry of Social Welfare has been assigned to be the coordinator of the implementations of the National Constitutional Court ruling. Those are the positive things that are coming up uh, in Indonesia. But uh, the situation is we still have a huge gap to fill in the future. First, 
is like because the structure of a, of the control of the government in the agrarian uh, resources, in the land and tender resources, is very much controlled. 80% or the majority, the vast majority of the control of the tenure uh, and land resources in Indonesia, including forests, is very much in the hand of the Ministry of Forestry. The Ministry of Forestry control 80% of, uh, of the total areas of Indonesia. And they are the one that's supposed to be firstly uh, in charge in the implementations of the uh, MK, uh, the Constitutional Court ruling. What happened was two of the policies, uh, first is the circular letter by the ministry, and the second one is the ministerial decree that have been issued by uh, the Ministry of Forestry are very much uh, in contrary to the Constitutional Court ruling. The Constitutional Court ruling accept the legal uh, entity of indigenous peoples based on first is the map, the participatory map, and the second one by the decree of a, of Bupati, or head of district, which is the case of the Kasepuhan Chisitu. But then what happened, the Ministry of Forestry set higher standard than the Constitutional Court itself. That's actually, they said that they are beyond the highest level of the uh, decision making, uh, of the legal uh, 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 making in this country, which is the uh, constitutional court. So, uh, and then the second one, the uh, case of the cement debating Abu, where they actually used the law that was adopted five months after the constitutional court ruling was issued. They used, the uh, intentionally, deliberately used that law to punish indigenous peoples who they call living in the national park. So those are the uh, negative responses from the institutions, from the ministry that's supposed to implement first the uh, national court uh, ruling. They're supposed to set the boundary, that should be first, set the boundaries of indigenous customary forests and state forests. And then from there, what is supposed to be done uh, after the setting the boundaries is to then talk on the plan, development plan, what is supposed to be done in those areas. Indigenous peoples, we are willing to contribute to the national development. We are willing to contribute. We are rich. Uh, but what we need is our rights to be protected, to be recognized. And from there, we can live together. We can share those uh, uh, wealth. Uh, but the recognition and protection is still far. The uh, draft law on the protection and the recognition on the rights of indigenous people are still being discussed by the parliament. And again, the Ministry of Forestry uh, hasn't shown any uh, gesture that they are willing to push this uh, forward. It's been almost a year since they've been appointed as the coordinator, but they haven't done uh, anything significant yet. So, uh, the, those are the uh, main, uh, and we're talking about targeting degraded and generally available land for industries. You can only get those if you have the protections of the rights of indigenous peoples. We are willing to talk with government, we are willing to talk with industries, but first, we have to recognize uh, our rights. And the main homework of this country is we need the reorganization and restructuring of the tenure uh, 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 control. We have to have equal uh, power among all the ministries and institutions to have 
to, to, to deal with uh, resources. We can't, we can't move forward with the uh, territorial reform if we have one institution like Ministry of Forestry who is super power uh, to lead this country. So those we need to redistribute. Uh, we need to um, redistribute, and that's the only way we can assure that the protections of people's rights, of indigenous, of farmers, of local communities, and also the certainty of business can be assured. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luca. I think you've uh, eloquently presented uh, what are, in many countries in Asia and many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the complex challenges associated with what scholars refer to often as a wicked problem, namely, whose property belongs to whom. Uh, and this is an ongoing issue, and you highlighted a particular case in Indonesia, which again is very common in many parts of the developing world, of the complex nature of managing protected areas and rights which existed before protected areas existed and how they can still be protected after they have been established. And again, where there are very rich colonial precedents, but which have continued in terms of the gazetting of additional national park areas, even in the contemporary era. So we'll come back to this, I'm sure, Ruka, and I'm sure the audience will have questions too. Our last speaker is Kim, and Kim is going to take us back to the sort of transnational regulatory world uh, and talk to us a little bit more about how FSC operates and the role that certification can play in terms of addressing some of the illegality issues that Santos has spoken about. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Andrew. And, uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, 20 years of experience in FSC in dealing with governance on a market-based way and in a way that is engaging multi-stakeholder discussions. Um, FSC comes out of a strong, strong frustration with the lack of intergovernmental ability to deal with the issue of responsible or sustainable forest management. We are now 20 years old. Uh, what we have established is a system of engaging market leaders and also of engaging multi-stakeholder communities in setting the standards for what responsible forest management looks like globally and also in countries around the world. We've established a system whereby environmental actors, social actors and economic actors get together in a set of forums where none of these sets of actors can overrule the others. There has to be agreement across these interests. We have members inside FSC from the environmental community. We have environmental organizations like Greenpeace, like WWF as our members, a number of other environmental organizations. We have major actors from the social communities around the world, such as indigenous people's organizations and the trade unions and development organizations as members of our social community. And we have a large number of uh, important economic actors, both including forest owners, including forest concessionaires, including companies who are at all stages of the, of the uh, supply chain in uh, forest uh, products. And what we've done is that through discussions across these chambers, we have set up standards for what responsible forest management is agreed to be. Has it worked? I'll answer yes in two ways. One way is that it has worked in terms of actual penetration in the market. We have 100 mil 180 million hectares of forest certified across the world under FSC. We have 28,000 companies engaged in FSC as certificate holders. And we are in that way sort of the most and strongest global engagement strategy for sustainable forest management that involves the market. I'll answer yes to the question whether it's worked in another way by referring to a very recent C4 study about the social impacts of FSC certification in the Congo Basin. What was looked at by C4 in that study was comparing FSC certified concessions with non-FSC certified concessions. And to be very honest, I was surprised 
to see the consistent overperformance of the FSC certified concessions over the non-certified concessions in terms of the social impact of FSC certification. Consistently, we had better performance in terms of workers, workers' conditions, better performance in terms of engagement with local communities and indigenous groups, better performance in terms of children's education and all other aspects of uh, social issues. I think it would be very, very interesting to look at the same kind of study in other areas than the Congo Basin, because I think it would be very interesting to see what would the similar study look like if we did that in Indonesia and other countries in Southeast Asia, and also in the Amazon Basin. I think we would be very interested in, uh, in working with C4 to, uh, to uh, see a thing like, like that. FSC is at the moment now facing, in many ways, different developments in the situation around us. We've heard before from uh, Ambassador Skog about the uh, discussions that the EU is having on setting up uh, bilateral agreements with Indonesia on the FLEC VPA setup and the SVLK coming up in Indonesia, which is for us, of course, a different situation in the sense that we are now seeing a government legality framework that is serious in a way that we have never seen before. And which means, of course, that we need to look at how our system can complement and fit together with the SVLK. I believe that is perfectly possible, and it's certainly one thing that we would be very interested and are very interested in exploring in the, in the years going forward. We're also seeing, I believe, a, in Indonesia, a very significant potential shift in the business model of some of the major players in the forest sector. I'm thinking about companies like APP and APRO, who are now developing forest conservation strategies, which I believe are largely, or in many ways, inspired by the kind of multi-stakeholder engagements and discussions that have happened inside FSC. And we are now, of course, in informal discussions with companies like APP and APRO about how could they possibly fit into the FSC model going forward. We are not there yet at all, but I think maybe even quicker than an 11-year process like the uh, EU VPA process, we may be able to look into something that would get these companies back into a system of multi-stakeholder governance that I believe would be very interesting and important for their future uh, performance in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kim. Just to try and wrap up, uh, I think a very rich collection of presentations, what struck me is that uh, we've heard in many cases that considerable progress has been made and continues to be made. There are several initi initiatives which still need the test of time to show to what extent they are contributing to improving governance. And of course, there are still many challenges. And before I open up the floor for a Q&A session with you, I just want to ask two Quick questions. One which I will cluster to address to Tisikun, Ruka, and Masantosa in relation to the property rights issues. But firstly, I just wanted to ask both uh, Kim and uh, Olive School. One of the challenges I think we face with many of the international, the transnational regulatory frameworks is the question of access, particularly for small and medium enterprises, given that the costs of certification. Uh, accreditation or whatever validation processes that they have to go through tend to be very high. So I just wanted to ask you to what extent in terms of both the flag T process but also the FSC, are you actually trying to address this and trying to provide the sorts of incentives that might actually enable much greater participation among small and medium enterprises? Well, I can say that uh, the issue of engaging uh, smallholders is one that we have been working on for several years. We now have about 150,000 smallholders engaged in the FSC system worldwide. Is that enough? By no means. We are very far from being enough. We're working on improving and strengthening our system by, we've set up what we call a smallholders fund, which is providing funding for smallholders to gain experience and to become models for smallholder engagement globally. Uh, one of those projects is happening here in Indonesia. We're also working on training. So we're training trainer, do we doing train the trainers program that I believe would help also in making it possible for engaging smallholders. 
we are consistently working on trying to find ways in which we can make our standards simpler and easier to deal with for smallholders and communities, uh, including indigenous communities, because we believe that is crucially important. And we believe it is possible. However, what we cannot allow, of course, is to lose the credibility of the, uh, the strength of the standards. So I think we're working on solutions, but we're not there yet. I think uh, what Carsten just said coincides with the experience we've had in the, in the years we're working on this. Um, there has been various uh, discussions, I think, over the years, whether we would start with just some part of the market and exclude the others, etc. But I think the idea now is to cover all of it. That adds this particular challenge of re reaching out to the, the smallholders, uh, because if you add them up, they actually make, make up quite an important part of the system. So for, in order for it to be credible, I think you need to have them involved. Now, how do we uh, facilitate their the possibilities financially to, to for them to? I think we di we will discuss that also with them because for now it's really up to the Indonesian government to ensure that everyone is on board, etc. And let's see if there is a need for the EU to make sure that some of the support we're giving to Indonesia in climate change, etc., should be channeled towards helping uh, smallholders to. Uh, to be, uh, you know, capable of of, uh, of uh, ad adapting to the system that, that needs to be seen. Okay, thanks very much. I think in, in both cases we'll, we'll interpret liberally your answers as as a sort of framework for ideas that need to be explored and constitute that as a commitment on both of the, the school. Um, so now, just before I open up the floor, um, I wanted to frame a question: given these vexing problems associated with property rights that I'm going to address to the other three members of the panel. Um, we've heard from Ruka of some of the concerns that she's raised vis-a-vis -vis rights and the way law can sometimes be implemented uh, in a certain way with some negative consequences. And she was referring to, I think it's law number 18 from 2013, um, which uh, on the elimination or eradication and prevention of forest degradation. Um, but I think the more important issue is how can we reconcile the differences between different interest groups when different statutes have been applied at different times? I don't know the particular case of the national park you were referring to and whether this is a national park that was established in Indonesia during Dutch colonial rule or it's a national park that was established after independence. But both exist in Indonesia. Both are characterized, as in many other parts of the world, by what I would call porous boundaries. The communities continue to move in and out of these protected areas because ultimately they were very often customary lands before the protected areas were established. But I think if I frame the question in two parts, one is perhaps Tisi Kun can tell us a little bit more about how Cambodia has been able to address this issue. And then the specific question I have for both La Santosa and Ruka is, even after the Constitutional Court decision in 2013, the other critical issue, 2012, sorry, the lawyer is always going to be here. Yeah, right. uh, my apologies. Um, the decision in 2012 still leaves open the question of the legal definition of indigeneity as a precondition or a precursor to being able to make a claim to indigenous or communal land. And this is an issue that has vexed other countries in the region. So I wanted to ask both of you, what is the government of Indonesia doing in terms of trying to address this issue, in terms of trying to move that debate forward? But, so perhaps Ruka and Mas and then we'll hear from Tisi Kun in terms of the experiences from Cambodia. I need to check if I'm a lady or not. Okay, uh, thank you very much. On the, uh, you talk about the uh, definitions of indigenous peoples. Uh, it's been a uh, international um, uh, agreement that uh, there shouldn't be definitions of indigenous peoples. That's why during the adoptions of the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, there is no definitions. Uh, why? Because definition tend to define something, put something in the box that can actually uh, exclude many of uh, those outside the box from the rights that, that they deserve. 
uh, that's the basic uh, argument behind the uh, absence of definitions of indigenous peoples. But in the context of Indonesia, um, uh, to make sure that things are clear, that it is clear what we call indigenous peoples or masyarakat adat from the other, uh, the rest of the uh, society. That's why we uh, actually we propose at least two main uh, characteristics, which is the territorial and the history of the people. Uh, the if you but if you want to refer of those existing definitions uh, in the law in the Indonesian law, you can actually refer to the law on the management of uh, marine coastal areas and small islands. It has definitions of indigenous peoples there, of masyarakat adat. And the second one that you can look into that is the environmental law, 2009, where actually both of these share common definitions of indigenous peoples, of masyarakat adat. So there are actually existing uh, definitions in Indonesian law. Uh, but that's again the problem is, if we make law, we tend to ignore other uh, laws, those existing laws, and that's also happened. That's why now, with the, uh, the discussions on the draft law with the parliament, they're still talking about the definition where well, actually they already have something exist. They only need to go and look back into the existing definition, the other, and also the uh, positional court ruling also provides some characteristic. It doesn't define, because that's also the main thinking that you shouldn't define, because you define something, that means you tend to ignore or exclude more. So, like if you say, in Indi in masyarakat adat in Indonesia should be living in the same territories intact or something. How about those who have lost their land to companies? How about those who whose land has been locked? So that's why definition, main characteristic is important. The main um, uh, element is important to set, but not the definition. So that's uh, that's my. Um, it's it's easier for the government of Indonesia when Buka has already mentioned there are at least two uh, what do you call it two uh, laws two definitions in two laws yeah, uh, which are more susceptible for protection and the uh, recognition of uh, So uh, I, I think this is, this is very important to be uh, considered by the uh, government, especially the uh, Ministry of Forestry as a leading sector for what call it, for formulating the new law uh, in relation to uh, protection and the recognition of masyarakat kumada. Um, related to uh, what do you call it, uh, Ruka has already mentioned about victimization uh, from the law, the new law on the 18 number 2000, 2013 actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much interested to know more about, about, about that case actually because the, the main goal of the law number 18, 2013 is to combat more organized crime in the forestry sector. So if the enforcement officers uses that law to victimize the indigenous people or the marginalized people, I think that's in contrary with the main goal of the law number 18, 2013. Well, I think, Pakistan Tosi, you, you raise a very important point, and I think there, as a cautionary note, there are potentially similar risks uh, when laws are used to prosecute people in terms of the use of fire. Lest we forget, fire has been a practice amongst many 
communities in Indonesia probably for hundreds of years. Um, and so there are similar risks, I think, in terms of potential victimization of smallholders um, rather than some of the other actors who may be involved in using fire. Anyway, let's close now so we can open. Oh, sorry, Tisikun. Thank you. Uh, I would like to share in, for Cambodia case that the local people or indigenous uh, people right have been recognized in the law and regulation. Uh, even in the forestry law, fishery law, or protected area uh, law that we have recognize that uh, community, local community play a very uh, important role. And all the local community uh, always claim that they are not uh, part of the problem. <coughs> Therefore, we would like to make sure that uh, they are the part of the solution. So, uh, how to to recognize this uh, right in the law is uh, when we uh, draft or uh, making this regulation and uh, uh, law uh, always through the public consultation. It's a very intensive <laughs> public consultation in making law process in Cambodia. Law sometimes take more than a decade to reach the adoption is what we have learned. And also, we we not challenge with the recognition law because government uh, firm that uh, on this uh, position. But the challenge is uh, the capacity of that the local uh, community of indigenous people that uh, to build, to make them more uh, effective in exercising their right. That's uh, the key I think we would like to share with Indonesia. And thank you for that. Many thanks, Tisikun. And since uh, Tisikun and uh, the previous speakers were talking about law, I think Padma Santosa remembers when Pakuntoro took office in Ugaba Empat, he also went public in announcing that he had found that there were, if I recall the figure, 12,000 pieces of subsidiary legislation in Indonesia which weren't aligned with national legislation. And he took on that noble task of trying to reconcile. But let's leave that there and now open up the floor. We welcome questions. Uh, see one, two hands. Can you just, can we get some microphones, please? Okay, uh, my name is Adelok, I'm from Cambodia. Uh, the question um, will go to Roka and another representative from EU. The question is around about a little bit contrasting between the legal timber threats and indigenous rights. As the people discussion around the room, that uh, one side they try to promote uh, timber cutting through legal process, while at the same time, indigenous people and community, they try to claim their own land take the forest for the next generations. So the question will go to Roka. Uh, whether, did you know something about the legal timber trade between EU and Indonesia? And what kind of benefit that you are expected from this legal timber trade? In the representative of your uh, indigenous people and communities. Uh, and also, I want to hear from EU whether, did you, th did you think something about what kind of benefit that you are going to provide to the local community and IP? Uh, second question is about uh, leakage. <laughs> yeah. Well, I immediately asked Ambassador, do you have one? <laughs> uh, and he said, we're going to have one very soon. Uh, so I don't have actually clear answer to that. 
Uh, but again, when you talk about the how the uh, uh, the legality will benefit indigenous, I think it's depending on the elements of the legal, uh, what you call uh, the legal uh, itself. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the the law that's supposed to combat illegal logging has uh, victimized indigenous peoples, and uh, also we like we believe in the in the market based. Uh, uh, mechanism like uh, our SPO and FSC hasn't been uh, really um, uh, effective on indigenous peoples. One of uh, just yesterday, one of uh, indigenous our members in Muaratai uh, has been bulldozed down uh, by one of the company that is actually member of our SPO, and they have been uh, sent. Uh, letter by our SPO to stop the operation, but they continue, and this time they're using, they came with military personnel. So uh, these are the challenges, so it's, it's not really the questions of how these things will benefit indigenous, but at first that you have to have that people element in the regulations and law, and whatever, whatever you know, the cooperation you have or initiative, you have to have that. Thank you. Yeah, but briefly, I think um, our system uh, is aimed at ensuring uh, that the exploitation of the natural resources of Indonesia are sustainable. Uh, the, there is a legal test to that. If we did not have this demand in Indonesia, I think everyone would be worse off. There would be other markets less demanding. Um, do we? Uh, well, uh, but for us, if it's legal and certified legal in Indonesian terms, it will eventually be good enough for us, but it will not be good enough for us if there is clear and flagrant violations of indigenous right in that process, that's for sure. Um, final point, we're not just doing this, we're doing a lot of other things as the European Union in Indonesia, including empowering communities to uh, assert their rights in terms of spatial planning, how natural resources are used, etc., and to defend their own rights. So it's a, it's a very vast uh, commitment from us. Thank you. And just to compliment, for those of you who attended one of the panels yesterday, you may have heard Pak Sultan speak about the experiences of an association called APEC Gadje, which has been one of the first in Indonesia that, through collective action, successfully circumnavigated the cost issue by getting certification for SVLK as a group. So, a success story. Hans for you. Thank you, Andrew. Hans Frederick, the Director General of the International Network for Bamboo and Rattan. One of the issues with the EU timber regulation is that bamboo, which is not a tree but a grass species, is not really recognized as such. FSC is another question whether FSC really covers bamboo or not. I'd like to know the discussions about the VPA in Indonesia. Have you recognized? the special role of bamboo, and how does that fit in the local discussion? Thank you. Thanks very much. I think, uh, Olaf, you're going to have to take that question in the first instance. Actually, I could not answer that question, but you deserve an answer, and I'm glad that we do have experts uh, in, in the room, so perhaps uh, 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 a bamboo expert in the room. And so I may just pass that question on. Uh, or direct you to uh, experts afterwards. We don't have a separate standard for bamboo. Uh, it is possible to certify bamboo inside a forest context, so, so in, in a forest environment it can be done. Uh, so that is definitely possible and we do have examples of that, but we do not have a separate standard for bamboo at this point in time at least. That's where Ambassador Scott said that we can take that up bilaterally afterwards, Hans Frederick. And uh, clearly, this is the beginning of a new commitment. Thank you very much. Um, ECRAF, over in the corner. Yes, yes. Uh, I am in Scott Bode. I work for ECRAF. Um, I have a question again for the EU. Um, my concern is in my work in uh, the West Africa, the domestic wood products uh, markets are quite vibrant and active, and as you had mentioned earlier, a lot of the FLEG VPA standards are now going to be applied 
are starting to be applied to, you know, beyond the export market. So, is there a discussion, formal discussion going on within the EU about the complexities and the importance of these domestic fuel wood, timber, charcoal markets um, in terms of illegality or legality? I, I think a lot of people's livelihoods are dependent on that. And these are informal markets. Therefore, often, like in Sierra Leone, for example, they are illegal, yet they're very important to the country and they're very important to a lot of the people that depend on those products. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Olaf, would you like to answer that? Or yeah, I'm happy to jump in if you're not. Um, I mean, I think, again, I would strongly suggest you, you check out C4's website and see, again, a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, there is an enormous amount of material that has been published specifically on the domestic timber market in Indonesia, in Cameroon, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Gabon, and in Ecuador. Uh, this was an EC-funded project called Proformal, which is actually in the final throes of being uh, finalized. So there's a lot of information. I think the point you raise is very important. Our own research that goes back six, seven years in Cameroon indicated very clearly when the flag tea process was first starting that the domestic timber market was as big and as important as the export market. And this led to a change in the flag policy process where I think, Andy will correct me if I'm wrong, four out of the five countries which have negotiated EPAs in Africa have addressed both export and domestic timber issues. So it's an important issue, but I hope that answers. Osni, you had a question. Thank you very much, and thanks for the time for a very interesting discussion. When we hear that the EU it took about 10 years to reach this, uh, implement this flect, and uh, we hear from the FSC about the success, one would answer, ask the question, why not cut it short and devolve the process to something with uh, an organization like FSC? And instead of going, you know, maybe if you go to another country, uh, it will take another 10 years or so. And if this happens, this uh, devolution, how would the uh, governments represented here and the indigenous pe people feel about something like this? Thank you. I don't think there's a contradiction between the F what FSC is doing and, and what, we, what we're doing. The fact that this has been 10 years, that we are breaking historic ground. This has not been done anywhere else. Um, what we offer is access to the EU market. Uh, uh, no, uh, not necessarily. What we need to ensure is that the timber regulations that are set in place, uh, which are uh, legally binding for all EU, European, uh, the whole European market, 500 million people, that Indonesia can match that and get the value that that market represents. So I think there is no shortcuts to be done, but certainly the lessons learned uh, and, and by the way, I don't think it's, it's not the EU process that has taken 10 years, it's the implementation of the Indonesian side that takes time as well. It's extremely difficult. Um, but, you know, if we're there soon, hopefully that will be an ex extremely useful example to be used in, in, in other countries as well. I wondered if we could explore um, the gap between what is legal and what is actually necessary in terms of ecological sustainability and social um, uh, responsibility and, and acceptability. Uh, because we can't make the assumption that's implicit in a lot of what's being said that um, legality fixes everything. Legality is only as good as the law. And um, certainly in my experience, it's often falling far short of what is actually required to address the issues that we've been talking about at this summit. You know, it may be that an area is allocated okay for logging and you log it legally, you get certification, etc. but actually it ought to be logged at all. Uh, you know, that type of a thing. So I just wonder whether, um, well, I don't know, I could almost ask the entire panel, but uh, I think, um, I mean, Kim probably operates in this 
area of, of, of difference. So it was interesting to me to hear you talk about the SVLK and harmonising with FSC because that I'm not sure what that means about this distinction. Um, also, possibly the EU and, and uh, Rooker in relation to this. Thank you. Yeah, I think for us this is this is a very important uh, distinction uh, because legality for us is the first of our ten principles and, and therefore it is a crucial aspect of what, what FSC is all about. I mean, without legality you cannot be FSC certified. But we have nine other uh, principles of which some will of course also relate to the legislation because the legislation doesn't only talk about legality per se but it's also about some aspects of sustainability, some aspects of social rights, etc. So for us legality is the basis but there's a lot beyond that. And I have yet to see a domestic legislation anywhere in the world that actually fits with what we consider to be responsible forest management. I have not yet seen that. And I believe for us, at least from a market-based perspective and from a stakeholder engagement perspective, it is important to have that possibility of adding on to the legal requirements, which are important and a necessary basis, what the stakeholders actually want to see implemented including the indigenous issues, including the workers' rights issues, including the, the environmental organization issues. And I think what could be a fantastic thing would be if we had a more of a conversation across these different initiatives. I think they are complementary, but I think we are actually focusing too little on talking with each other about the experiences that we have and how we actually make them complementary and not just state that they probably are. Thanks very much, Kim. Santos, would you like to add to that in terms of your opinion? No, I think the last point Kim raised about uh, the need for much greater dialogue across multiple initiatives. We've only touched on some of these policy arenas. We haven't even talked about the validation process associated with carbon standards and all that's associated with those. Um, Yalmaz, you had another. Yalmaz, the Leaky Office Depot. Can it's widely believed or accepted that the 1994 rule that FSC has around plantations has limited the uptake of the FSC system in tropical forests. Would you comment on what, if anything, FSC is doing to look at that rule and perhaps revise or adjust it to allow greater uptake? Happy to. I doubt that you will find anybody in the FSC system who thinks that the 1994 rule is, at this point in time, the right approach to the issue. The difficulty is that when the 1994 rule was set in, into place, it was a very good rule to actually avoid creating an incentive for conversion of forest into plantations. And that, I think, has been historically very, very important and is something that we should be proud of. However, 1994 rule doesn't really make sense anymore, since 1994 is too long ago to actually be a sensible solution. What we need to find, however, is some other ruling that will actually make sure that we still have the disincentive to conversion and to deforestation, while at the same time making it possible to also certify areas in particularly this region, which have been converted since 1994 and where the situation is now changing. I believe some of the answers will lie in discussions about forest restoration and compensation issues. They will lie in finding other ways than just a fixed date for, for, the, uh, for the compensation, but I don't know what exactly it will be. We have our General Assembly in FSC again this year in Sydney in Spain in September, and this discussion will come up there with a view to finding new solutions and more creative ideas. And we are very interested in receiving ideas from our stakeholders as well. Thanks very much, Kim. one quick last question because we, we need to close at one. Uh, my name is Faisal Parrish, uh, working with the Assistant Secretariat on a uh, regional program on sustainable management of peat uh, with the 10 ASIN member states and uh, partners, including the EU and others, where we hope to have a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, way of working uh, to share, share amongst ongoing initiatives and planned initiatives. My specific question is for, for Masama. You uh, highlighted some key progress uh, by UK, Bay and PAC. Uh, and agencies in recent times. However, what we're seeing on the ground is still very serious problems, such as the very large-scale fires in uh, Rio 
in 2013 and 2014, and with an El Nino uh, year being predicted this year, we anticipate that to get the worst. Uh, in 2013, 46% of the fires were on land or under the moratorium. So, can you uh, give some further elaboration on how you feel the measures that you're going to be taking are going to be serious enough to really prevent this uh, large-scale expansion, particularly by medium-sized uh, players, into an area which you've already said is no-go area, but it's still going ahead? Are you looking at land confiscation? blocking sale of uh, products or, or sale of the land uh, for those areas cleared by fire. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Yes, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm just uh, highlighting about the enforcement practice, actually. But I think the most, the more important than enforcement is prevention. That's why um, um, we are working uh, together with the other ministries, especially coordinating minister for people's welfare, which is in charge for the prevention of the forest and land fires, and we need to work together with uh, with the local government as well. So I'm sure in the in the uh, in the future, in the near future, um, uh, the coordination will be taken up by the Vice President to ensure the prevention related programs are, are what do you call it, are uh, implemented. So uh, for example, now we are working in, in, uh, in uh, promulgating, promulgating the, the protection of the uh, peatland ecosystem, for example. So now we are discussing how the regulation itself can, can respond to the forest and land fires uh, on the Gambut ecosystem. So there are some programs that will be launched, especially in preventing land forest fires. Many thanks, Mas Santoso. I'm going to be extremely brief because uh, I'm the person between you and your lunch. Um, so just to, to conclude, and before we thank all our panelists for their contributions, I think, again, to reiterate what I uh, s said earlier, I think we've heard some very interesting perspectives at very different scales that highlight the complexity of multi-level governance. Many initiatives which are ongoing at different levels in terms of the transnational initiatives led by the European Union, other international organizations such as FSC, Many of the challenges that are still faced and the initiatives that have been taken at the national level, particularly with reference to Indonesia. And I think we can conclude that there's much room for hope in terms of even some of the commitments that we've heard and the initial steps that have been taken today. And I hope that this will just be the beginning of many different dialogues in many different corners of the world to continue this debate on these ongoing governance challenges. So thank you very much for all of your participation, your questions, and please join me in thanking the panelists.